Hi, it's Maria from Still Dreaming Homestead. Really happy to be back with you. We're going to continue reading in our book, On the Banks of Plum Creek, by Laura Ingalls Wilder. We're already on Chapter 9, and it's called Grasshopper Weather. Hmm, wonder what that means. Let's take a look at the little picture they have. Looks like some bees. Now, plums were ripening on the wild plum thickets along the Plum Creek. Plum trees were low trees. They grew close together with little scratchy branches all strung with thin-skinned, juicy plums. All around the air was sweet and sleepy and wings hummed. Pa was plowing all the land across the creek where he had cut the hay. Early, before the sun came up, when Laura went to drive Spot to meet the cattle at the gray boulder, Pete and Bright were gone from the stable. Pa had yoked them to the plow and had gone to work. Now remember, yoke was that wooden thing and it had neck holes. With one would have their neck here and the other one there. And then they would pull together because we're stronger. When we've got help. Same thing with oxen. When Laura and Mary had washed the breakfast dishes, they took tin, tin pails and went to pick plums. From the top of their house, they could see Pa plowing. The oxen and the plow and Pa crawled slowly along a curve of the prairie. They looked very small and a little smoke of dust blew up from the plow. Every day, the velvety, brown, dark patch of plowed ground grew bigger. It ate up the silvery, gold stubble field beyond the hay stacks. It spread over the prairie waves. It was going to be a very big wheat field. And when someday Pa cut the wheat, he and Ma and Laura and Mary could have everything that they could think of. They would have a house and horses and candy every day when Pa made the wheat crop. Laura went wading through the tall grasses to the plum thickets by the creek. Her sunbonnet hung down her back and she swung her tin pail. The grasses were crisping yellow now and dozens of little grasshoppers jumped crackling away from Laura's swishing feet. Mary came walking behind in the path Laura made, and she kept her sunbonnet on. When they came to the plum thicket, they set down their big pails. They filled their little pails with plums and emptied them into the big pails till they were full. Then they carried the big pails back to the roof of the dugout. On the clean grass, Ma spread clean cloths, and Laura and Mary laid the plums on the cloths to dry in the sun. Next winter, they would have dried plums to eat. The shade of the plum thickets was a thin shade. Sunshine flickered between the narrow leaves overhead. The little branches sagged with their weight of plums and plums had fallen and rolled together between the drifts of long grass underfoot. Some were smashed, some were smooth and perfect and some had cracked open, showing the juicy yellow inside. Bees and hornets stood thick along the cracks, sucking up the juices with all their might. Their scaly tails wiggled with joy. They were too busy and too happy to sting. When Laura poked at them with a blade of grass, they only moved a step and did not stop sucking up the good plum juice. Laura put all the good plums in her pail, but she flicked the hornets off the cracked plums with her fingernail and quickly popped the plum into her mouth. It was sweet and warm and juicy. The hornets buzzed around her in dismay. They did not know what had happened to their plum, but in a minute they pushed into the crowd, sucking at another one. I declare you eat more plums than you pick, Mary said. I don't either do any such thing, Laura contradicted. I pick up every plum I eat. You know very well what I mean, 
Mary said crossly. You just play around while I work. But Laura filled her pail as quickly as Mary filled hers. Mary was cross because she would rather sew or read than pick plums. But Laura hated to st sit still. She liked picking plums. She liked to shake the trees. You must know exactly how to shake a plum tree. If you shake too hard, the green plums will fall and that wastes them. If you shake too softly, you do not get all the ripe plums. In the night, they will fall and smash and be wasted. Laura learned exactly how to shake a plum tree. She held its scaling rough bowl, I guess that means trunk, and shook it. Gent, one quick gentle shake. Oh, maybe that means branch. Every plum swung on its stem and all around her they fell pattering. Then one more jerk and the plums were swinging and the last ripe plums fell plumpity plump, plump plump, plumpity plump. There were many kinds of plums. When the red ones were all picked, the yellow ones were ripe. Then the blue ones, the largest of all, were the very last. They were the frost plums that would not ripen until after a frost. One morning, the whole world was delicately silvered. Every blade of grass was silvery and the path had a sheet, thin sheen. It was hot like fire under Laura's bare feet and they left dark footprints in it. The air was cold in her nose and her breath steamed. So did spots. When the sun came up, the whole prairie sparkled. Millions of tiny, tiny sparks of color blazed on the grasses. That day, the frost plums were ripe. They were large purple plums, and all over the purple was a silvery thin sheen that looked like frost. The sun was so hot now, and the nights were chilly. The prairie was almost the tawny color that's kind of a brownish color, of the haystacks. The smell of the air was different and the sky was not so sharply blue now. Still, the sunshine was warm at noon. There was no rain and no frost. It was almost Thanksgiving time and there was no snow. I don't know what to make of it, Pa said. I never saw weather like this. Pa said the old timers call it grasshopper weather. Whatever do they mean by that? Ma asked him. Pa shook his head. You can't prove it by me. Grasshopper weather was what Nelson said. I couldn't make out what he meant by it, though. Likely it's some old Norwegian saying, Ma said. Laura liked the sound of the words. And when she ran through the crackling prairie grasses and saw the grasshoppers jumping, she sang to herself, Grasshopper weather, grasshopper weather. And that's the end of that chapter. That was a good one. What do you think is the reason they called it grasshopper weather? Maybe because the grasshoppers could live much longer if there wasn't a freeze? Maybe. Well, it's Maria from Still Dreaming Homestead. I want to pray blessings on you and yours in your house and out of your house in the day and the night. And whatever you do, keep dreaming. Keep a smile on your face. If you haven't subscribed yet to my channel, please do. I read a story almost every single evening, um, as well as I tell other types of stories. I'm always looking for new subscribers. If you know anybody else that would like it, please share it. And if you hit that notification bell after you subscribe, you'll find out each time I get to post a new video. All right. Well, have a wonderful evening. Good night.